Okay, John. <clears throat> All right, the Zoom room is filling up. I see our participants are streaming in here. Welcome to Football Letter Live. As usual, tell us who you are and where you're from in the chat box. We have a great program lined up for you tonight. We have members of the uh, Penn Stater Magazine staff with us. They're going to talk about the 100 greatest athletes, plus about 50 to 60 more, uh, and the issue that they recently did uh, where they ranked uh, athletes from Penn State. And we have a special guest with us tonight, Salima Rockwell, All-American volleyball player, will join us this evening. We will get started in just a minute or two. Welcome. I see Joe Ellen from Vermont. I see Lynn Yingling right here in State College. Good to see you, Lynn. Russ Mitchell from Syracuse. Joe Clifford from Cunningham. Steve Catch from Bethlehem. Joanne DeGroat, uh, England, uh, engineering, class of 73. Fremont, California, represented Dean Van Fleet. Dean, good to see you. I haven't seen you in a while. It's great to see your name here. Larry Barber, Peter Sheridan. A great audience tonight for Football Letter Live. Pat Nicolano from Sea Isle City, New Jersey. Welcome, Pat. Mark Johnson, Myrtle Beach. I see Judy Wolf, Pat's sister in California, also joining us. Where else would you rather be than a Zoom full of Penn Staters? I'm Paul Clifford, CEO of the Penn State Alumni Association. Welcome to Football Letter Live. We air at 8 o'clock every Thursday, and tonight we are going behind the scenes with the Penn Stater magazine, including looking at the publication's list of top 100 athletes in Penn State history. Live closed captions are available for this event. You can access them by clicking the closed caption button at the bottom of your Zoom video window and then clicking show subtitle. You may also customize your caption experience by clicking the stream text link posted in the chat. We are recording this session and we are gonna share it across all of our social media channels afterwards. Tonight, I'm joined by the legendary editor of the football letter, John Black. John, good evening. Good evening, Paul, great to be here. I'm so excited about tonight's show. We have uh, a great guest uh, joining us, three great guests actually, with our colleagues at the Penn Stater Magazine, and we're gonna get to them in just a minute. If you have questions for John or for any of our guests tonight, make sure you put those questions in the Q&A tab in the bottom of your Zoom bar there. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of college football news, John. Um, you were, I think you were able to participate in the virtual media day. Uh, James Franklin confirming Micah Parsons not coming back, uh, but, but also um, re revealing some other, some other news this week. Uh, what did you hear at virtual media day, John? Well, uh, Micah may not be coming back, but his scholarship is coming back. <laughs> uh, for snapper Chris uh, Stoll, who uh, received a scholarship uh, and he was he has been a walk on our long snapper doing such a great job uh, that uh, it, as soon as uh, it was clear that Michael was not coming back that was an available scholarship that the uh, coach 
quickly passed on to uh, Chris Stoll, who has uh, worked very hard to, to uh, deserve it. But uh, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, the coach is very uh, eager to get back on the field with his uh, players, he, just as eager as they are. And he thinks he's got uh, three uh, great new coaches uh, assistants uh, with the team this year, and he's all excited about all of them and uh, expecting a, a high-powered team, both offensively, defensively, and, of course, uh, special teams. fact is, that's another thing. Uh, the special teams have been, a, well, uh, the, the uh, football teams in the Big Ten this year have been allowed to use the word, uh, the number zero as one of the numbers uh, on the, uh, the uh, jerseys. So uh, they quickly, uh, Coach Franklin quickly uh, decided that the special team uh, key player should get the honor of wearing that zero number. And uh, everybody's eager to see who that will be when uh, the team takes the field in another uh, two weeks. And uh, it should be a, a, a great honor for the, per the special teams player who gets to wear that zero number. Uh, but yeah, there have been a lot of other developments uh, this, this week. Uh, you know, in 30 uh, games now between uh, the three uh, conferences that have already started playing uh, college football. 30 games have been canceled or uh, at least uh, postponed uh, until late in the season. Uh, the latest, of course, was uh, the one pitting national defending national champion LSU against Florida and number ranked uh, Gators. Uh, just have too many uh, players coming down with COVID to be able to uh, put a full team on the field. So that uh, has been postponed. Lou Saban, coach at Alabama, tested positive uh, this week. Uh, so uh, things are going to be tough. We trust the uh, Big Ten teams following their uh, very tight uh, protocols will all be able to uh, play their full schedule. Absolutely. Uh, Penn State was ranked number nine this week, even though they haven't played a game yet, nor have the other ranked uh, Big Ten teams, number six, Ohio State, number 16, Wisconsin, number 20, Michigan, and number 25, Minnesota. But uh, at any rate, it's uh, a lot of happenings. A lot of happenings. A lot, a lot happening. Uh, you and I talked earlier this week. I think the Big Ten will actually end up with two top seven teams, if I'm doing my math right, once all of the pollsters start to put – um, the Big Ten teams into their rankings. I think Ohio State and Penn State uh, will both move up in the rankings, as will all the other Big Ten teams. But I think we'll be in really good position again to uh, to control our destiny as we as we look for another run to the college football playoffs. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Dr. Barron came out this week and a, a number of announcements. I know Penn Staters are so excited about Penn State football and and uh, the thought that some might want to come back to state college to celebrate is, is something that's, that's concerning for the university. And it's uh, concerning for our students who are, who are right now, um, it looks like we're going to be able to finish out the semester. You know, um, they, we have this kind of bubble created for our students. And so with the start of football, there's obviously some concern that, um, that folks will descend on state college and, and want to experience game day here, even though they can't go into the stadium. And so we are just encouraging uh, Penn Staters to celebrate where you are. Uh, I know our chapters are being really creative all around the country. Uh, I know Penn State Athletics has a lot planned for um, game day virtually. And so we're encouraging everybody to uh, gather with the people who are in your bubble and uh, celebrate Penn State football and send us pictures, post them on Facebook, tag the Alumni Association, tag Penn State Athletics uh, and let us know how you're experiencing Penn State football this year and uh, at the same time helping stop the spread of COVID-19 um, all around the country, but especially here on, on campus for our, for our students. Uh, John, we had an exciting announcement this week. As you know, fans won't be in the stadium for football this year, uh, but we are uh, we are not keeping the class of 2020 or the class of 2021 out of, out of the football stadium. Right. Uh, we, 
we announced this uh, just this past week that the Alumni Association is going to be uh, putting a banner, one of those huge section wide banners uh, where the SO normally sits, uh, paying tribute to the members of the class of 20, uh, classes of 20 and 21. It's going to be a large S with the blue background that you'll be able to see uh, from above. But as, as you get closer and closer, you'll be able to read the names of all of the class members from both of those classes who have been, uh, had their Penn State experience impacted by uh, COVID-19. You can see on the screen some of our, our initial artwork. As everybody knows, the S-Zone is a staple of Lion Ambassador programming and the Alumni Association is so proud to sponsor the Ambassadors and the Blue White Society. And just, a, just another way to honor the, both of those classes who are uh, having their Penn State experience altered by COVID-19. You know, another, another thing to think about uh, within, uh, by the middle of November, of course, uh, there's expectations that uh, ice hockey and uh, basketball will be getting underway. Right. And it's interesting to look back, you know, uh, since January 2007, Penn State has won 21 NCAA championships, which is double the next highest total by any Big Ten team. Wow. So it's, it's not only football that's a great sport here at Penn State, our flagship sport, of course, but we've got so many other great teams, both men's and women's, that uh, represent uh, our university very uh, well uh, nationally, both on and off the, uh, their specific courts or fields. And uh, it's, uh, you know, we've got a, one of the top uh, four programs in the country so far as the number of men's and women's sports, total of uh, uh, 31 varsity sports. And uh, there are a lot, a lot of uh, athletes, student athletes to root for in several sports at Penn State. So it is, um, it, it is, and it's even interesting to, to speculate how many more we would have added last year. The wrestlers were primed for another run in the NCAA tournament, probably would have been their hardest run to an NCAA championship in recent memory, but still had a chance to make a run there. Hockey was poised uh, for a run there at the end of the season. Right. And look, I think, I think Penn State basketball was poised. The only thing that stopped Penn State basketball was COVID-19. And so they were ready to shock the world and, and put Penn State basketball back on the map. And so uh, right. who knows how many more national championships we could have added uh, to, the, uh, to the trophy case. But, uh, but I, look, I, I'm excited to see what we do this year on all the courts and fields and ice and rinks and everywhere where we compete. Of course, we've always got wrestling, and uh, last year at least we would have had uh, uh, the men's uh, lacrosse team uh, in the right. running, and uh, some of our spring other spring sports as well. So it's it's a great all-around program here at Penn State. Well, John, speaking of sports, that's what we're going to talk more about tonight. We have guests with us this evening. Let's welcome them into the show. Uh, he is the editor of the Penn Stater magazine. He's from member of the class of 1995. Ryan Jones is with us. Welcome, Ryan. Thanks, Paul. Good to see you. Good to be here. Good, good to see you. Uh, also, the art director, his images and his style bring the Penn Stater to life. Please welcome Mark Kaufman. Thanks, Paul. Excited to talk about 100 greatest athletes at Penn State tonight. Yeah, and speaking of the 100 greatest athletes, we have one of them with us tonight. 1994 Penn State graduate, three-time All-American, who helped Penn, lead Penn State Volleyball to three national championships. She was a member of the U.S. national team from 1995 to 1999. She served as an alternate on the 96 Olympic team uh, and a member of the women's volleyball coach from 2006 to 2008, and then came back from 2013 to 2017 Please welcome Salima Rockwell. Salima, welcome. Hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm excited to be on. Well, we are so excited to have you. Ryan, let me, let me start with you, though. What were you thinking when you took on the task of not only trying to list the top 100 athletes, but then to assign a number to each of them? Take us behind the scenes and share how you came up with the idea to spotlight the 100 athletes. 
Well, you know, I mean, kind of getting to what you and John were talking about a bit earlier, the wealth of, of greatness at Penn State, right? The number of great athletes we've had across so many sports for so long. Um, it, it felt like a, a kind of a no-brainer to, to find a way to celebrate that in, in, in kind of a big comprehensive way. Uh, the ranking then, Paul, was your idea, if I remember correctly, right? Wasn't that <laughs> <laughs> that is that is false. That that is false because uh, the ranking might have been a little different, in my that's opinion. True, that's true, and that's I mean that's really a great point. Was that you know we knew going in, and it was one of the things we sort of wrote when we introduced it in the magazine. Was listen, there's not a there's no definitive right way to say these one through one hundred are the greatest one hundred athletes, but we wanted to take a look at at really highlighting the sort of best we could based on a variety of, of metrics and accomplishments from you know, all American honors and records set and championship teams they were a part of while they were at Penn State, as well as what they did after the fact. Um, so we really tried to look at, at kind of the full resume of, you know, thousands of great athletes who've come through Penn State over the years. And then we narrowed that down. Uh, Mike Weinreb, who's a 94 grad um, and uh, a longtime Penn State kind of um, uh, sports writer and, and a guy who just really has observed the program at a pretty deep level for a long time. He and I worked together and he really kind of did the dirty work and, and the legwork on this of pulling it together. But we also pulled in a lot of experts across eras and generations, including our own John Black, Lou Prado, who's sort of a longtime Penn State sports historian, a number of other folks, Ken Hickman at the Sports Museum on campus, to really get as much input as we could. Uh, also from some coaches across campus, current and retired. So tried to get as comprehensive uh, of a picture as we could. And then, yeah, we took a shot at, at ranking them. And like I said, if we did it ourselves a year later, that top 100 might have looked a little different here and there. Um, certainly every year there's people who are potentially adding themselves to that mix. Uh, and we tried to acknowledge that as well in the issue. So we knew it would stir up some conversation and debate, but mostly we wanted to just honor as many of the great Penn State athletes as we could. That's the great thing about sport, right? It's, it's the debate that sports fans have all the time, my team's better than yours, and this is why, and this player was was better than this player from a different era, right? So I think you kind of tapped into that. Uh, Salima, what was your reaction when you learned that you were in the top 100? Well, it was, um, yeah, I was pretty, I mean, it's a big deal. It's a big deal, yeah. like you guys talked about, there's so many athletes, and if you think about, you know, for those of you listening, how many sports we have, and even within one season and how many athletes are just on campus in one given year, you know, whatever that is, 800 student athletes right. or something like that. Um, it's a really, really big deal. So I was, um, I, oh boy, here come the pictures. Oh boy. <laughs> 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 I'm, I'm blown away. I'm honored. And, and it's kind of funny. And I'll say this of course in jest, but, um, you know, so then once it comes out and you realize, then, then you look at the rankings, right? And you start right. calling each other. <laughs> and you're like, wait a minute, what happened? How did this work? Uh, so kind of, kind of funny in that sense, but um, a huge honor. And I, I'm, I, I'm just thrilled to be a part of it. I would imagine that there was a lot of kind of friendly ribbing of, of classmates that were on the list, but I'm sure you heard from people you hadn't heard from in a number of years was uh was that outpouring in that reconnection uh you know one of one of the great memories and one of the great takeaways from being in this edition no for sure i i mean i'm i have to say first of all though i you know being penn state and like we are and how connected yes. we all are um you know so many connections you don't lose over the years and there's so many people that i've already been talking to and always you know in communication with that were like Oh my goodness, I just saw it. I saw this. Like people were mailing it to me, like making copies of it. I have I have a lot of copies and uh, thinking they were the only ones sending it. And that that was really, really cool. Or some old professors, um, you know, just people that I hadn't talked to in years reaching out. Um, and and that's you know, that's the beauty of Penn State. That's the beauty of of you know Happy Valley and and where we live and how we we were in college and those connections we had and how much people care. And um, it was pretty, pretty cool. Yeah. Salima, so, with the distinguished uh, career that you had as a player here at Penn State, uh, what would you uh, say was your greatest accomplishment as a Penn State student athlete? <sighs> you know, I, 
I don't want to be cliche, but I really, and maybe it's, it's part of who I am and my position, but really the greatest accomplishment is helping, helping lift up my teammates and helping my team be better. You know, it wasn't about me. You know, I realized that it was, it was bigger than me and it was about Penn State and about my team. So for me, I, I loved uh, celebrating our success as a team and other people's success on the court and um, our success for the university. Um, you know, certainly getting to the Final Four in 1993 was a really, really big deal. First Final Four uh, the Penn State volleyball program had. And, um, you know, just coming in, I had so much respect for the team. That's why I came to Penn State. You know, it's such a good program, but we had that, couldn't get over that regional hump. Kept going to Nebraska, kept going to Nebraska, losing. Yeah. Going to Nebraska. Uh, you know, when it was set up that way. And for us to be able to kind of break through that and, right. you know, bust through that to open up the floodgates for the amazing things that came after me uh, was, was probably the greatest accomplishment. Right. And as, as the setter, basically you were the quarterback of the team. You were the leader of the team. You were the captain of the team and you certainly had a great run here at Penn State. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate so, that. Lima, we hear from Penn Staters all the time and you have the opportunity to represent uh, not only Penn State, but represent our country on the world stage. Share with us an interesting interaction or kind of what we call your favorite we are moment with Penn Staters um, as you represented, uh, as you represented uh, our country competing in volleyball. I was uh, actually, it's funny you'd ask, I always run into people in airports, you know, right. see people in airports, someone's wearing, you know, we are, you get the whole thing. Um, even internationally that, you know, it wasn't that uncommon really. I wasn't. Right. Terribly surprised, but I was in, um, I was in, I think Macau or Guiyang, somewhere in China, right. and in the lobby of a hotel, and somebody said my name, and but my last name, Davidson, and it was an old professor that was traveling, and he was in the lobby, and that's what he called everybody by their last names, and I was like, you have got to be kidding me, and we got to talk for a few minutes. So that was kind of one of the coolest moments that I had um, traveling and, and seeing people across the globe. It's pretty cool. So after your playing days were over, you came back to Penn State and you were a coach, right? You made that, you made that transition from player to coach and you got to coach right alongside the legendary Russ Rose. Uh, talk about, about that transition. And if you have a Russ Rose story, I'm, I'm sure no one would be disappointed to hear a good, clean, family-friendly Russ Rose story. <laughs> oh my goodness gracious! Um, well, first of all, it was it was amazing uh, having the opportunity to come back. I was so grateful to to be able to come back and and coach. I started out as a director of operations my first year in in 2006, and then um, you know had the opportunity to to transition into the coaching role. And I mean, it was just as you, you might imagine, you know, Russ is who he is. So lots of laughs, lots of hard work. Uh, not much actually changed from when I went to school in the nineties uh, with the same drills and the same uh, expectation, expectations of excellence and um, work ethic. So, um, you know, my, we, we, we go back so far. So when he was recruiting me as a high schooler, so we just have that kind of relationship. So it was, it was awesome. It was awesome. Just being, being able to give back what I, what I got from my assistants, Karen Wallenstein and Aaron Tomlin, you know, they were there to mentor me and to help me. And that's, you know, it's the best part of the job is really being able to be there for the student athletes and, and yes, the X's and O's and winning is amazing, but uh, being a mentor and someone that can help them flourish uh, when they leave Penn State is a really big deal. And that was that's my favorite part. Salima, so, was there any was there any difference in coaching at Penn State and in that uh, interim term when you coached at Texas for a few years? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, there are big differences. Um, just different programs. You know, it's it's for me it's really eye opening and interesting to see how you can be at this level and do things so differently. You know, I, I, I knew a certain way. It's, it's how I played. It's where I came from. And then um, going to Texas and work with Coach Elliott, who's amazing as well. 
just a little bit different in their approaches and how they train, um, what they may focus on in practice, how they approach things differently. Um, but, but certainly another way that you can achieve great success um, doing, just doing things differently. So it was, it was good for my growth. Well, we were, we were very happy to have you come back again and give us several more years of uh, your coaching experience there. Well, it was, it was good coming back. And every transition is so hard. And it's try to make the right moves for so many reasons. It's not just the coaching and going here, you know, but it's your family and, and your kids and your spouse and what's right right now in this time in your life. And um, totally. you know, it's hard. It's hard for everyone. But, you know, as soon as you can kind of step back and let go of a little bit of the expectations, you can kind of just function and do what you need to do. Right. So it was great being back. So, Salima, one last question before we let you go tonight. What are you up to nowadays? Oh, man. Okay. <laughs> so, a lot. <laughs> I do a lot of random things. Um, let's see. The first thing I'm doing, I'm working with a local club. It's called Austin Juniors Volleyball Club. It's one of the clubs here in Austin. I'm helping train the coaches, helping them with some recruiting as well, um, and helping coach one of the teams. But what I've been doing in the fall is TV. So that that was a fortunate thing that I, I got asked to do. I did Big Ten Network last season for volleyball, uh, ESPN, Longhorn Network uh, as well, and was fortunate enough to, to do the selection show and, uh, you know, do the mid-game and, and post-game shows at the Final Four. So that's been a lot of fun, a challenge, but a lot of fun. Well, it has been so great to have you on Football Letter Live. You're an ambassador for your sport. You're an ambassador for our institution. And we're truly grateful uh, for how you've gone off and represented Penn State. And thank you for joining us. A top 100 athlete, Salima Rockwell. Thanks for joining us this evening. Thank you guys so much. It was great seeing all of you. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Right. Take care. Take care. How long? Mark Kaufman, let's, uh, let's uh, bring you into the program a little bit. So, uh, so your editor has this, uh, has this crazy idea to write a story about 100 athletes and then rank them. And then you have to find a way to bring those words off the paper with art. Uh, talk a little bit about that creative process and how you approach, uh, you know, photography. First of all, sourcing all that photography um, photography from across generations. Uh, what was that? What was that challenge like? Yeah, usually big picture when we start off with any issue is what else is in the feature well, you know, so we had a feature, a, a political feature this issue. We had a feature on alumni firefighters. Um, I think pretty early on we knew this was going to be the cover feature. Um, and so visually, how do we execute that. We could have gone a couple different directions. Uh, you know, we could have shown right away Jack Ham, the number one on the cover. Um, but we decided there's a mystery to showing multiple people and not just like the number one or the top 10. So um, we had actually reached out to a London-based uh, photo collage artist. And that's kind of what you're seeing here, his early initial sketches. Um, we had to dig for hundreds of images and when Ryan first presented this, um, I didn't even know if some of these athletes predated photography. I mean, we go back to the early 1900s um, up to, you know, 2015. I don't know. You know, do we even have uh, um, somebody from 1906 or 1900? So um, when we started doing the, the research and photos and, and getting halfway there, we had some amazing resources here at Penn State with the university archives up in the library. Um, so I would say the bulk, probably 80% of our hundreds of images that we dug up came from the university archives. But we also used, um, there were one or two images from the sports museum. Uh, we got a few images from Penn State athletics, like I think Saquon Barkley in the middle of the cover there was like a preseason PR shot. Um, We've shot numerous student athletes at the magazine. So we pulled from our own archives, a couple like Raquel Rodriguez and, and Shane Ryan, the swimmer. And then I think a few from the football letter. So the bulk of the images we were able to get from Penn State sources, but it took four or five weeks to dig all that up. 
Um, there were a handful that we had to go out of, outside of Penn State to some stock agencies. And so I think like we did that where we were looking for maybe some, uh, some of the professional accomplishments of some of the athletes. So number you, one, Jack Ham, that's actually a, a, an associated press shot that you see there in the first spread of the magazine. So um, when Ryan where, where, brought where, the list of 100, where, where um, did, where it was you exciting. Get, where did you get your John Montgomery Ward? Picture? Well, that, that's, that came out of the archives and that was something pretty special because yeah. um, it surprised me with, with him I had no idea that he pioneered the curveball in baseball. <laughs> the Penn Stater pioneered the curveball in baseball back in like the 1870s. Right. So there he is. And when you dig through the archives and you see an image like that, it's like, wow, well, you know, no question we have to run an image like that. And then there you see Raquel Rod Rodriguez, who we hired a photographer to shoot a couple years ago. Um, so in the feature that we're looking at here, you see, we finally decided that we did want to show every single athlete and uh, we were able to accomplish that. Um, what we did across the bottom there was silhouetting uh, images out, um, was, was a painstakingly slow process. Um, here's an example of, of doing that um, for all the images on the cover in the feature. Um, and it also shows how do you take images from a hundred years and merge them together and kind of make them feel the same. So the one way we did that was we stripped all the color out. We made all the images uh, black and white for the cover and across the bottom of the layout. Um, and then we painted in the Penn State blue so it was all consistent. So, you know, you're looking at, you know, two examples there, but you know, that was, that was done for a hundred athletes and it was fun. It was fun digging through and, and editing down um, there's an example of uh, Lydell Mitchell from the archives. Um, one of the things we knew we were doing with doing this photo collage approach, we knew that we had to cut people out of backgrounds. And right. so those are the type of images we were looking for. Um, and then on top of that, if there was any great imagery that might work um, large on the pages in the feature. Um, so there, Lydell drinking the Gatorade as a, a, a cult didn't make it. Um, but that's just one example, you know, Lydell Mitchell up in the archives, there could have been a box of a hundred images um, that we right. had to kind of like sort through quickly, decide, hey, these are the four or five images we want to scan and then, you know, hand those off to an illustrator. And also in-house, we did a lot of that work also. Hey, um, and John, John, you're seeing the cover of the Penn Stater magazine, January, 1972. That's right. Penn Stater magazine has had a long history of, covering Penn State athletics, but I believe, was this the first, this was the first issue under the name, the Penn Stater, right? That's correct. That's correct. When I uh, became editor in 1970, it was called the Alumni News, uh, the Penn State Alumni News, and uh, it, 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 it didn't seem to me, I mean, it had had that title f uh, from its inception back in 1920, but it didn't seem to me that it really fit uh, at that time, 50 years later, because it was not really timely as a news vehicle. It was a feature magazine. And uh, I, I, had, I changed the name to the Penn Stater, and uh, that's how it's been known ever since. But I think that more aptly uh, describes what it is as a feature magazine with uh, stories about the university and about the uh, students, faculty, the people that make make up Penn State and make it what it is today. We got a comment, a shout out to Charlie Pittman and other great athletes from Judy Wolf, uh, other great athletes in the class of 1970 who are patiently awaiting their pioneer induction ceremony and class <laughs> reunion. Yes, COVID-19 uh, forced us to cancel that, but we will get to that once it's safe for us to all gather. Judy, glad you're tuning in from, from Orange County. Uh, so Ryan, let's, let's go through, and that, actually I'll throw this out to you and to John Black, because I know you mentioned John uh, had some, of the, some input into the rankings, some input into the, uh, into the athletes that we, that we chose for, or that you chose. I had nothing to do with choosing them. Uh, with, the, with the top one, the top 100 athletes. Uh, but were there, 
were there any people that weren't on your initial list that through your research uh, you had learned about and added them to the uh, to the list because of what you had learned about reading about them? There were, and and um, you know some of it honestly came from it came from really um, diverse sources as far as some of the folks we talked to. Uh, some of the ones that were, you know some were pretty easy, right? I mean, volleyball's got this list of all these all Americans from over the years. Of, you know, particularly over the past 20 or 25, going back to Salima's era, where you just had all these players who've been two and three time All-Americans, certainly over the past 20 years now you've had multiple national champions. You, you know, we could have included 30 or 40 women's volleyball players. We could have included another 20 or 30 wrestlers. We could have recruited 100 football players, right? But some of the sports weren't quite as obvious um, and track and field was a big one. Our colleague, Jason Jackson, the Alumni Association, really had great perspective on track and field. He's a former track and cross country athlete at Penn State, a letter winner. Um, and, you know, we were going mostly through records. Okay, who had, you know, won multiple national championships, you know, in track and field, well, that made it easy. But there were a couple who, for a variety of reasons, uh, and I'm, I'm blanking on the name now, Jason's gonna kill me. Um, but there was a runner who's on, who is on our list, who I think was there at the same time that Steve Prefontaine was at Oregon, right? So the only right. guy he couldn't beat was one of the greatest runners in the history of the sport. So in a couple of cases, the fact that they may not have won more than say one championship wasn't reflective of how good they were. It just had to do with sort of rough timing. Uh, or I think uh, Greg Fredericks, I believe, missed out in the 1980 Olympics because of the boycott, if I'm remembering this correctly. Right. I, you know, he would have been an Olympian if not for that. So yeah. in some cases, their, their, their record of accomplishment was a little bit deceptive. Um, so, so there were definitely some examples there. The track ones are the ones that stick in my head where um, you know, we, we added some folks into the mix um, based on maybe we had overlooked them initially, but we sort of got some expert uh, guidance on that, absolutely. Yeah. Well, and you had, you had uh, the uh, fence, fencing teams and some other teams that are not nearly as well known. Right, exactly. And you know, we tried to really, the one thing we said is if we're going to do this, we're, we're going to really spread it out. Um, right you know, as broadly as we can. And, and again, in a place like Penn State, you can do that from, from soccer to volleyball to wrestling to fencing to obviously football. And again, I mean, we could have done, we could have done 500 easily, right? right. You could add 100 football players, 50 wrestlers, 50 volleyball players. I mean, it would not have been hard to do. It would have been just as justified to really highlight so many great accomplishments. Um, Joanne is asking, I'm, I'm just, uh, just jumped <laughs> into the chat there and it's a great question. Do you have a bowler on the list? Uh, we don't, um, because varsity here, it, it was a relatively short span, right, John? Where, where, short span. Uh, varsity uh, bowling existed, but we did do, Mark, help me out, was it two, two and a half years ago? We did a, a right. full-length feature in the magazine uh, on the national champion women's bowling team. Right. Was it 78, 77, I think it was 78, 79. 79, I think, 1979, yes. Okay. Don, so, Don Farrell, the first. Uh, Don Farrell was the first coach. Don Farrell at Penn State, yes. Yeah. Right. So Joanne, we, we did not include them on the list just because it was there were a relatively small number of teams who competed and Penn State was varsity for such a short amount of time. But uh, we were really happy to be able to highlight that, particularly that national champions women's bowling team uh, a couple of years ago in the magazine. We did get a couple of boxers in there and that was a big sport at Penn State uh, back up until about the uh, late 50s. Yeah, reading about some, that era, John, has been really, really fascinating. Penn State was a powerhouse uh, in collegiate boxing for, for decades and decades, and there are a few uh, boxers on the list, like you said. Yeah, that, it's the way that sports have changed, the way that college sports have changed, and the way that Penn State in, in different areas has, you know, again, was great in a sport that no longer really exists at a high level in, in college. But yeah, it was, it was really neat to dig back through that. The one thing that I was surprised to see were how many multi-sport athletes there were. Yes. I think there were 10 to 11 on the list. You know, we had two in the top five, like Candy Finn and Jesse Arnell. Um, but then there was one who made the top 50 that stuck in my mind, and I think memorable because of his name, Hinky Haynes. Hinky um, Haynes. Is the only person in history to win a World Series and an NFL championship. Wow. And it just kind of goes and, and shows the level of these aren't just great Penn State athletes. These are, you know, great athletes uh, that the world knows about. So there were a lot of neat surprises uh, with the list that uh, Ryan and, and Mike came up with and everybody. 
And, and Paul, just to jump on to, I mean, you know, Mark obviously had a chance to explain it, but one of the, the reasons that we could do this confidently was because we've got someone with Mark's talent experience. A lot of alumni magazines couldn't have frankly pulled this off this way. So we're really lucky to know that we could take this big, huge, difficult, time consuming product and say, here, Mark, you'll solve this, right? And he did. So not everybody could do that. We try not to take that for granted. We're not going to do it every issue, but uh, <laughs> uh, next year so, we're doing 100 to 200, right? <laughs> so well, one of the, um, one, one of the, I guess, maybe worst kept secrets around the Alumni Association is the number of wrestling fans that we have that work on the staff. And I remember perhaps one of the most ridiculous conversations I've ever had uh, since coming to the Alumni Association was, uh, was how to rank the wrestlers. And, and it was ridiculous because I think at one point, and I'm not going to say who, but someone said, well, they only have two national championships <laughs> and these guys have three three dash so we were parsing national champions yeah. against each other it was uh um it, it's an embarrassment of riches when you think of some of our programs the, the other challenge i know you all had is at the time we probably had probably close to a dozen students on campus that were that were all americans that were reigning national champions how did where did you draw the line how did you decide who to put into the top 100 and 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 kind of where to cut it off and not put current student athletes into the top 100? I think part of our thinking there, you know, we have, a, and I don't remember, I think it came up. Yeah, here we go. In the, in the spread yeah. next on the list. I think our thinking was really, how can we get as many names as possible on here? So instead of including athletes who were still current student athletes at the time, like you said, Paul, we said, you know what, since they're still on campus, let's sort of set them aside uh, and, and have them sort of as the next on the list. You know, we, it's going to be hard to keep Trace McSorley off any greatest list of, of Penn State athletes, given the record he had, the wins and the, and the statistics. Uh, you see some of the other names on there, you know, a couple of wrestlers. Lamar Stevens obviously just finished his phenomenal basketball career, uh, soccer, hockey, lacrosse. You know, so we kind of covered volleyball again. Um, you know, we wanted to sort of recognize every year there's probably a half dozen or a dozen athletes on campus who you, who, who you can look at and go, wow, these are some of the greatest who've ever played here. And there's just so many people, you know, it feels like, again, you could put 500 into the top 100 is really how it felt. So that was just a chance for us to highlight, uh, to focus on current student athletes and, and just kind of cheat a little bit and get more names in there. Yeah, you know, one of the, fa one of my favorite things about the Penn Stater is how you cover sports. Um, you cover sports, certainly in the sports section of, of the magazine. But then from time to time, you also pull either sports stories or stories of former athletes out um, and feature them in the feature well. I, and, and I love the balance that you all bring between featuring athletic accomplishments and then some of the accomplishments, like I think of Gary Aberly, who has been featured. I think of what you did with Kurt Warner and, and telling Kurt Warner's story. Um, it, it's really... Um, uh, you really are able to tell the stories of their accomplishments both on and off the field. And this is just a continuation um, of the Penn Staters magazine, really good record in, uh, in this regard. Uh, I appreciate that, Paul. And that's, you know, I started out my career as a sports writer. And I think one thing you learn early on covering sports is that the best stories don't usually have all that much to do with X's and O's and on the field results, right? It's being able to tell the stories of people uh, in this case, people we care about because we know about them through their athletic accomplishments, but the things that maybe make them most interesting are what happened off the field, whether it's in their families uh, or their, live after their lives after their sports. Um, yeah, Kurt Warner's story, you know, he and his family put a book out, I think it's been about two years now, uh, about um, two of their, their twin sons uh, who are on the autism spectrum pretty severely. Uh, and then their two other sons, including Jonathan, who played football at Penn State, um, so it was just a really compelling story to be able to tell and uh, any Penn Stater, you know, whether you remember Kurt Warner from those incredible 1980s teams in his career or you just a, are a Penn State fan or just a person who loves a compelling story, you know, I mean, that, that connected with people, I think, uh, regardless of their interest or their generation. So yeah, we're, we're, we're fortunate to be able to tell those stories. Yeah, and even our most recent cover featuring the artwork of Aaron Mabin. I mean, it's uh, uh, wonderful how uh, we cover uh, Penn State, Penn State sports, Penn State student athletes across all of our, across all of our sports. John, uh, you have seen the Penn Stater magazine evolve. You mentioned that you um, that the name changed when you were the editor. 
Uh, but I don't think you mentioned why you decided to change from from the alumni news to the Penn Stater, the Penn Stater magazine, which is now really an iconic name of alumni magazines across higher education. Well, uh, the alumni news was a was a common name, a common type of name that was used by other college publications. And as I say, I didn't really consider it a news vehicle because it came out a couple of months after the news items that you may have been that we may have been carrying in there. Uh, it's it's really a feature publication, and uh, it's telling stories about. Uh, things happening on campus about uh, key students and uh, faculty and also about great alumni and what they're accomplishing. So it really was a feature magazine and I just felt that that made the, the most sense and I felt Penn Stater was a, a term that would apply, could apply only to one magazine uh, and not uh, an alumni news which could apply to uh, numerous uh, universities across the country. Uh, but Regardless of how you looked at it, it seemed to me that uh, the, the, the goals, the objective of this communication, this uh, bi-monthly uh, publication coming into alumni homes was to maintain alumni interest and involvement with Penn State. And I think to do that, communications is the most important starting point for alumni engagement with their university. I mean, we've got a whole big network of chapters and uh, uh, college societies, campus societies, affiliate groups. We put on different events. Uh, you get volunteer opportunities for participation and leadership. You get recognition of alumni accomplishments. Uh, but the the whole thing starts out, I believe, with communications. And uh, the, 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 if this communications piece has expanded so much. Uh, when I was editor in 1970, in the early 70s, we had 32 pages, black and white, and right. that was it. So we finally started introducing a little bit of color in the mid-70s, and we uh, might eventually grow by the time uh, Donna Ten Clemson took over as editor. I think we may have uh, once or twice had 48-page issues. Today, it's 96-page right. issues routinely, and of course, it's not even, it's no longer a staple bound uh, publication. It's, it's right. uh, you know, it, it's, it's book bound and right. it's, 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 of course, color throughout and it's just uh, a magnificent publication, particularly the way they hold in, uh, hone in and hold their own among a great variety of national uh, magazines and uh, deliver the quality of articles and graphics and photos that the, that they do carry. That's well, amazing. Ryan and Mark, one one final question for you. Uh, I want to go back to the top one hundred, and you can reveal it. We have just you and and John and Mark and I, and uh, and and a hundred of our closest. Who was number one hundred and one? Go ahead. You can tell everybody who was <laughs> who didn't make the top hundred. Who was the hundred and first person on the list? You can. Paul, I would have technical issues. Tell us who you thought was number one over Jack Ham? So. <laughs> I am not going to. I am not answering that question either. <laughs> the, the number one debate was a lot of fun, and we had a lot of really compelling suggestions from folks. But I think we felt pretty good about Jack Ham ultimately. Uh, you you couldn't go wrong. That's the that's the beauty of this list, is that uh, anyone from from one to a hundred could have moved up twenty spots, and you wouldn't have gotten an argument. Um, from from anybody, I think that's the that's the quality of of this list that you all have put together, and, it, and it's been, look, I say one of the more ridiculous conversations. It was also uh, among the most fun conversations that we were that we were having at that time, is uh, because I think in our hearts we're all Penn State athletics fans across a lot of sports, and so uh, I think those were some really fun conversations. It certainly stirred up a lot of interest and controversy in its time. And uh, actually, I've decided to muddy the waters a little bit uh, in this upcoming uh, football letter. Right. I've stepped out on a limb and uh, decided to uh, list uh, in order, in rank order, uh, the 15 top 
football seasons oh, during wow. the 44 years that I've been the editor of the, of the uh, football letter. So uh, we may get another little controversy going and a lot of fun stirred up among very interested fans. I'm all for that. <laughs> Absolutely. Ryan, what is the next ranking issue that you're going to do? Uh, I'm going to rank the uh, top 100 Alumni Association CEOs. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, may, a, we may stay off the rankings for a little while. We'll see. We'll see. It, Definitely yeah, that a cover would be, story. Definitely a cover story. That's I, great. I'll, I'll I think we, do that, we, ought get, we ought to get Paul putting on a uniform and a helmet and a oh, for, you know, some sort of an action picture like this. <laughs> all right. Well, that's all the time we have this <laughs> evening. We want to thank our guests for joining us here and thank you for watching uh, another great episode of Football Letter Live. Again, check your inbox for the Football Letter on Saturday. You can uh, see a rerun of this. We will put the link for this show in there. Uh, and uh, feel free to share it with friends. We, we'd love to spread the good news of Penn State and her alumni and, and share uh, share these stories and the great work of my colleagues, uh, Ryan and Mark and, and John Black uh, and, and everyone else behind the scenes at the Penn Stater Magazine. It's a fantastic publication and alumni look forward to receiving it uh, every other month. So we're going to invite you to join us on the next Football Letter Live where our guest will be alumni award, uh, alumni achievement award recipient amongst many, many other awards that he won during his time on the gridiron. John Urschel is going to join us uh, on the next episode of Football Letter Live. Uh, next week, uh, we hope that you'll join us for our virtual speaker series on Tuesday at lunchtime, uh, nine o'clock in the morning. On Wednesdays, we have our coffee hour. Uh, we're going to be with wrestling legend, and I believe he was also a member of the, the top 100. I don't remember what number he was. Uh, but Kerry McCoy is going to join me on coffee hour. And so 9 o'clock Wednesday morning, tune in for Kerry and I's conversation. He is now the director and head coach of the California Olympic Regional Training Center. Additional information about all of our virtual events is available on our website. Go to alumni.psu.edu slash events to find out more information about all of our virtual events that we have coming up. Also, you can find um, information about our career resources. You can find information about the Renaissance Fund. Uh, the Alumni Association is the 2020 Renaissance Honoree. Uh, I know Mel just put in the chat box information about um, the cutouts in Beaver Stadium. Make sure that you're in Beaver Stadium this year uh, to support our student athletes. Buy a cutout. Uh, go to shop.fancutouts.com. Uh, and the link that is in the chat box there. Again, thank you to our guests. Thank you for all of you for tuning in every week for all you do for the university, for the glory, and for the future. We are Penn State. <laughs>